Welcome back. You know, it's so exciting when a bold composer dares to take on a classic work like Hamlet and then transforms it for the operatic stage. Today's new piece has been astonishing audiences with its brilliantly imaginative interpretation of Shakespeare's masterpiece. And now, audiences in cinemas are able to experience the musical riches and the theatrical daring of this operatic Hamlet as well. But, as compelling as opera is on the big screen, and it is, you do have to experience our art form live in the opera house to feel the full visceral effect of what we do. Nothing really can compare to hearing great voices soar over a world-class orchestra. So please, do come to the Met or visit your local opera company. Today, we have a new Hamlet. Next season, the Met will present two more new operas. Kevin Putz's The Hours and Terence Blanchard's Champion. The Met is committed to keeping opera vital and thriving, and that means expanding the operatic repertoire with important new works. But commissioning and staging grand opera at the highest artistic level comes at a great expense, and ticket sales only cover a fraction of the costs. The Met relies greatly on the generosity of audiences like you. So, if you are able, please consider making a donation to the Met. You can call us at 1-800-MET-OPERA or visit us at metopera.org backslash membership to make a contribution. We thank you so much for your support, as always. Now, the Met recently announced plans for next season's Live in HD series, and the lineup could not be more fabulous. Here's a preview. <laughs>
Next season's HD lineup looks absolutely amazing. But now, the man of the hour, Hamlet himself, Tanner Allen Clayton. Thank you so much for joining us, Alan. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's lovely to meet you too. It's a strange way to be meeting in front of a few folks, but it is a pleasure. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is, when we're talking about different mediums for storytelling, in Shakespeare's play, Hamlet has a sort of slow burn as a character, but in this treatment, it, he's just absolutely a bundle of energy right from the very beginning, or at least the way that you portray him. It feels almost like an aerobic workout. I, how, how does this feel to you? Well, it's the only exercise I get. So, <laughs> I mean, um, no, it is, I think, because, you know, because singing works takes longer than speaking them, yes. so we have to sort of get what we can across with, with the sort of the limited text we can take from the play. Right. That's what's so great about what Matthew and, and Brett have done. Well, I agree completely. I mean, it's incredible the way the story is being told, and if an artist has ever inhabited a role before, it is you as Hamlet. Something that's really amazing about this, and I'm not sure that everyone knows this, but Brett Dean had you and your voice and your persona in mind for the title role before he even began composing the piece. What was it like being part of that process and creating this role from scratch? It's amazing. Yeah. There's nothing more thrilling, you know. How many times do we wish we were in a rehearsal room where you'd say to Mozart, excuse me, Herr Mozart, why did you write that aria? Every like that? time. Exactly. Right. So with this, we could do that. And we could say to Brett, that's amazing. You know, why have you done that and how? And it's, it's great. Right, well, I, it's... It's incredible, I haven't had that experience, but it's amazing to watch how this process has played out and turned into this masterpiece. In playing Hamlet, you're following the tradition of some of the greatest actors in history, so no pressure, right? Laurence Olivier to Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch. It's not an easy name to say. <laughs> Do you feel the weight of history when you are considering a role that is this epic? I don't think so, because I think the great thing about Hamlet is that he is any of us, in any country in the world, any sex, gender, religion, it doesn't matter. And so being, being your own Hamlet is very easy. Um, taking on these words and making them themselves is a, is a privilege. Well, I take it that means you didn't do a whole lot of study of any of these actors as you went on. Still did a bit of that. A tiny bit of yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> well, for an actor, I think that playing Hamlet, as you say, can be considered the pinnacle of the career. How does this role feel to you in the grand scheme of what your career has been thus far. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> this is it, I've got nothing left. Well, this is it. All the there, that's it. Um, no, I, it's great. I mean, it, I probably will never do anything harder, anything longer in terms of the role. I mean, as you say, it's, it's sort of vocally and dramatically, it's everything. It's, you know, there's nothing left out uh, right. on stage at the end. So, I never thought I'd say that Peter Grimes is an easy sing, but compared to this, it is. So. Well, interestingly enough, Peter Grimes is in fact something that we are lucky to have you here with us for next season, and I am very excited to see that as well. Alan, I thank you so much for taking time during your break. Congratulations on this unbelievable and unforgettable portrayal, and I wish you uh, all the energy for the rest of this. Thanks. <laughs> thank you Thanks so much. It's a pleasure. With its musical forces spread throughout the opera house and an array of unusual items being used as musical instruments, Brett Dean's score is one of the most complex and challenging to conduct. Maestro Nicholas Carter recently spoke to us about what it's like to do just that. Brett's created a, um, a remarkable and um, almost explosive sound world um, uh, for this piece. At its essence, it's, uh, the orchestra that he uses is a fairly uh, traditional or standard orchestra, but in addition to that, he has three um, pretty large percussion batteries positioned in the orchestra pit, uh, playing all manner of different instruments, be it uh, you know, temple gongs, uh, vibraphones, uh, glockenspiels, of course, timpani. There are also extended techniques that the percussionists use, like using a double bass bow, which creates a particularly eerie kind of a sound and a unique overtone to the texture. And perhaps most uniquely for this, uh, for this piece, there are then two what are called satellite groups or satellite bands um, positioned in the, in the boxes on the left and right hand side of the auditorium, each consisting of a clarinetist, a trumpeter, and again, another percussionist. It's not as if simply the, the musical drama is happening up there on stage and in the pitch but really we're immersed in the, in the, in the sound um, and it sort of serves the purpose of uh, transporting us perhaps really inside Hamlet's mind itself. There are new and uh, fascinating instruments that he incorporates into the percussion section like a steel spring. There's what's called a mark tree, which is sort of this, uh, this uh, sort of chain of, of, of bells which sort of create a, uh, a fascinating texture. Stones, two stones being hit together. 
plastic bottles, like a cheap plastic bottle, empty bottle, which is then uh, crinkled up at particular moments, which again just sort of um, lends the whole score a particularly unsettling kind of an, an atmosphere, and again just sort of shows the, the instability in, in Hamlet's mind. The pit singers, or the semi-chorus, as they're called in the score, uh, provide a really uh, unique colour to the score as well. They're not only singing, you know, sometimes beautiful uh, lyrical passages, but also providing um, particularly percussive uh, sound effects uh, from their mouths, whether they're sort of saying sounds like <laughs> things like this, which are, you know, perhaps more akin to the sounds of the percussionist instruments than they are to the, to the singers on stage. It's another element, it's another dimension that's added to the orchestral texture and to the, to the vocal texture. I have no shame in saying it's the most challenging opera I've ever conducted, but uh, the more and more you come to terms with the score uh, and get over that initial terror, that initial uh, anxiety about it, the more the score reveals itself. There's so much going on, there's so much personality within the orchestra, there's so much uh, interaction with the stage, so um, you know you really feel as if you're part of the uh, part of the drama on stage when you're standing there in the pit, bringing it all to life. It's uh, it's an absolutely remarkable experience to be a part of. Well, after seeing that, you can understand probably why Maestro Carter is in the dressing room right now studying this diabolically challenging score. Now, I get to speak to Gertrude and Claudius, mezzo-soprano Sarah Connolly and baritone Rod Gilfrey. Hi, Christine. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're So, Sarah, Rod, understatement of the year, Hamlet's not exactly terribly happy with either one of you right now. <laughs> Um, but every character has its own perspective about the actions and reactions that are happening within the piece. What are your perspectives on your characters? You both had your own demons to deal with. Sarah, do you want to...? Uh, well, Gertrude's the innocent, um, certainly in this production, that she really has no idea that Claudius is planning what he's planning, and right up until the very last moment, I think. She's, she's growing slightly apart from him, but I don't think there's any... Um, suspicion at all that he intends for me to poison Hamlet. Well, you well, I gave the story away. I was going to say, no, that's the end of that. And you've just been thrown under the bus. Do you want to talk about your character's perspective? I think my, my character is so incredibly two-faced, really diabolical. He puts on this, you know, incredible show. He's actually murdered his brother. It's kind of, you know, unspeakable. Um, but it, what a great role to play. I mean, it's a real gift of a role. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Well, these are some of the greatest roles to play, where you have this kind of uh, opposite feeling yeah. to play against. Yeah. This is also an incredibly musically ambitious piece, and it's complicated beyond belief. Mm. What is it like to sing these roles? Well, I think I'm quite lucky, and I've got quite a lot of lyrical lines, which my friends have said, well, it's just not fair. We've, <laughs> we've actually got some nice lines. Um, so I'm very grateful to that. Thank you, Brett. Uh, but I'm, I'm really loving it. I'm, it's Honestly, I, it sounds sort of fangirling, but it's such an honour to sing in this house with this music. Um, it's something I've always us. wanted yeah. to, to do. And Rod is just a sensational husband in this. Uh, not a very good husband. Well, not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to give a shout out to, to Brett Dean and Heather Betts who are watching from London. I think it's London. Who knows? I can't see them. But we're loving your piece. I hope you're loving our performance. Um, Claudius, is, Claudius is uh, a peach of a role. I think I have the best role in the piece. Mm. Because I have less to say. <laughs> than than yeah. It's terrific, though. It's very difficult. I have to say, I have to study before yeah. every performance because yeah. it's tricky. Right. You know, but yeah. uh, great piece. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, this is the thing that's so amazing about it. Your maestro is so impressive. He has got everything under control, yes. and he is giving all of you everything that you need. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for giving us Thank the time. Christine. And Thanks. I look forward to seeing how the lives of Gertrude and Claudius are resolved in the yes. next act. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, we return to the final act of Hamlet, where the stage has been set for the murderous acts that will soon unfold. Laertes seeking vengeance for his dead father, Polonius. Ophelia's insanity and death by suicide. Claudius' own deadly plot to protect his crown, and above all, Hamlet's inescapable duty to his own murdered father, the king. Here is the powerful conclusion of Hamlet.
So as you guys can see, this is a recording that I took of a opera that I went to. Uh, now, the Cineplex, uh, which is a major uh, movie theater here in Canada, offers this service where they show Met Gala, uh, not Met Gala, but Met Operas, I should say, at the movie theater. So that way it allows you to see a Met Opera at the comforts of a movie theater. So obviously they tape it live, but then replayed in the movie theater. So it definitely gives, <coughs> excuse me, gives you a really great experience watching an opera, but in the comforts of a movie theater. Um, so obviously you can get popcorn and candies. And I know I've got a you know a couple dirty looks at people. Oh, how come you, you know what? It, you're not watching any of these people live. They're not hearing you. They're not seeing you. So for me, I'm not afraid of bringing in popcorn and all of that stuff, right? I haven't gone to see one uh, recently just because some of the sh more recent shows or uh, operas aren't really what I want to see. But that's, you know, fine. I don't expect to go to see every single opera that's being shown. And plus, there's been you know, more and more interest in movies uh, to watch. But definitely, guys, if you have this kind of feature at your local movie theater, take the opportunity to see at least one. You don't obviously have to see all of it, but sometimes, too, uh, they might be at a decent price or at a date and time that you have some free time and you're able to see an opera for yourself. Uh, now, obviously, I get it, guys. Opera and arts and all that stuff. It's not for everybody. You don't have to like it. Try it once. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of operas. And, oh, they're all fantastic. And, oh, my God, it's so awesome. Operas are okay for me. There are, you know, a couple operas here and there every once in a while. It's fun. It's interesting. It's not my thing. It's not my style. But it can be fun sometimes. Um, there were a couple opera shows that I saw that were reinterpretations of classics. And I was, you know, in my mind, I knew what the opera was or was supposed to be, but knew that it was going to be shown in a very different way. And it was fun to see a more uh, modern uh, reinterpretation of uh, the play and to see if this how this play would be presented if it was done in 2020 or 2022 or whatever, right? So sometimes it can be interesting just because you want to see a, a different experience and, you know, to sort of, you know, get out of my world of going to see horror and sci-fi movies because that's more the kind of movies that I enjoy and the kind of shows that I like to go see at a movie theater. Uh, the only thing that I don't like is that they tend to play it in the quote unquote regular movie theaters. Um, I have to, you know, admit, and I have said this before, I feel kind of spoiled going to see a movie in the VIP section because uh, the chairs are much more comfortable. And anybody who's uh, of a certain age, you kind of know how your back feels sometimes <laughs> when you're in, sitting in these movie theaters chairs. Uh, it's nice to have uh, the more comfortable chairs uh, available to you. So that's the only regret that when I go see uh, an opera is that the chairs aren't necessarily as comfortable as I like. And to be honest, it is, even though it is more expensive, it is nice to have food uh, be delivered to you once you order it. I, I do admit that's uh, something I spoil myself with, and it is a luxury. Um, you know, it's not definitely not a requirement when you're going to see uh, something at, at the movie theater. And obviously, guys, if you are pinching your pennies, this might be an expense that's not required for you. Obviously, going to see any movie or anything at a movie theater is obviously a, ch a choice, guys. I'm definitely not telling you have to go do this or else I'm not going to say think of you or say anything bad against you if you decide, yeah, you know what, I don't really like opera art. I'm not going to go pay any amount of money to go see a movie or anything at a movie theater. I get it, guys. Um, we all have to save our money or we all have our, uh, you know, priorities in how we spend our money. That's absolutely fine, guys. Um, this is just something I recommend. I enjoy uh, going to see these operas every once in a while. But again, it is a personal choice and a decision to make. Hopefully, if you do have an extra a uh, couple dollars and you're seeing these videos hopefully it encourages you to go watch them but again guys 
it is a choice and I enjoy it, but I understand if you're not really big on opera or you have other priorities financially to spend. I know that food has gone more expensive. Taking care of the kids has gone more expensive and difficult. And some of us, you know, maybe your, your kid is, you know, going through some medical issue or whatever the case might be. So I get it. If you guys aren't really into this and are, are living through me vicariously, that's fine. You know, sometimes too, there's certain things that I see you know, other people doing that. It's like, I see them going to Bora Bora or the Fiji Islands. And I'm like, okay, I'm not right now in a position where I can do these vacations or these wedding destinations and things like that. But it's nice to see the videos of other people going out there and enjoying and just sort of see, you know, have glimpses in other people's lives and to kind of live their, you know, live the life through them, you know? So if all you can do is watch these videos through me, great fantastic so i hope that either way that you see these videos and enjoy the content i know the video quality of these videos aren't too great they are on my crappy phone so the video is potatoes i understand i apologize i wish i could have better quality uh video so, uh, you know, when I upgrade my phone, hopefully I'll get a, uh, a newer phone soon. But for now, this is the quality that I have. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. So hopefully you guys enjoy this video and are uh, inspired to go see an opera. Even if it's in person, that's another way to potentially save a few dollars as well. So go see a local opera, uh, you know, at your convenience. But again, guys... I make no judgments. I know opera is not, it's not for everybody, right? If you can, uh, you know, go watch one. There's also contests that you can potentially join. Don't be ashamed, guys, to, hey, I want a ticket for an opera, for a movie, for this, for that, right? There's nothing wrong with entering a legitimate contest. And going to see an opera for the fun of it, just to say, hey, I want to see an opera. There's nothing wrong with trying it once and not liking. You guys can admit that, hey, I looked at an opera and didn't like it. There's a couple opera shows that I spent good money on and didn't like it. There's nothing wrong with that, guys. You don't have to like something because I liked it. Uh, you don't have to pretend to enjoy something simply because... I like arts. I it, it was I have to admit an acquired taste for me, um, but doesn't doesn't mean that I love every single painting I see, every single artist, every single. No, of course not. There's lots of movies and shows and artists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that I'm, uh, you know, I'll pass. Or yeah, you know what this person or this content or whatever offends me, and that's absolutely fine. So. Regardless of your thoughts, guys, just stay respectful. And if you do want to share your opinions on this video or on any of my content, please leave a comment and let me know what your thoughts are. As long as you're respectful, guys, I have no problems with you guys disagreeing with me or having a different opinion on the matter. So I hope that you guys do like this video. But even if you don't, give me a like, give me a dislike. Give me a comment, whatever you like. Engagement is engagement. Oh, gosh, there's so many things that appeal. I mean, of course, the character is extremely interesting. He's an extremely uh, emotional and a little bit touched in the head kind of guy. And he's, he's, got, he's got issues that are fun to explore on the stage. And, of course, the music is also really rewarding, especially like this last scene we just did. Um, you know, like this music really rewards me. I mean, this, it's rewarding all night long, but I mean, really, I, I attach myself very well to this character and I enjoy playing him. Well, I feel it. And, and with your soaring singing in the French language, Sonia, it's an absolute marvel dramatically as well. What is it like for you? Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous. I always, I always wanted to sing this part only in French, you know, because Verdi created it in French, and I think it makes sense musically. And all the vowels and the French is so expressive, it's so rich. Yes, it, it adds a new layer of beauty and dynamic. It feels completely different in French, frankly. Yeah. I never sang the Italian version, mm -hmm. but I mean, I've listened to it. I sang Lerma in the Italian version way back when <laughs> wow. I was a kid. Yeah, way, way back. We're talking. 
24 years ago or something, but I mean, like, I, but having listened to it a lot then, I mean, I think the opera feels completely different in French than it does in Italian, even though the music is largely the same, you know? Incredible. And with your director, David McVicker, mm -hmm. he says Don Carlos is like Verity's Hamlet. Is the role that complex? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about all the issues that the kid grew up with, I mean, beyond, like, having his mother die in childbirth, so there, there's some subconscious guilt probably attached there. Never meeting his dad until he was six. And when he meets his dad, the dad asks him to kiss the ring. You know, I mean, there's no, he's being raised by priests and, and nuns and nurses. And, um, you know, the historical Don Carlos also had epilepsy. I mean, yeah. like, or, or epilepsy, maybe they weren't able to define it exactly, but I think that's what it was. No, I mean, really, he had issues. And, uh, and so, like, historically, I, he asked for all that stuff. He wanted this to be a very flawed character, a, not a swashbuckling, come in and save the world with his sword type, you, you know, which is why, it, you know, in the second act, it goes completely wrong, because, of course, he draws a sword in the total wrong second. And, uh, you know, I mean, it is, it's, you know, he's, he's got issues. That's an incredible, and for Verdi's score, how is it, what is it like to bring this character to life in this way, and also, was there something David McVicker helped helped you to, to build a bridge with Elisabetta? Yes, we were, we were both, um, you know, on the, on the same path with David, because uh, we wanted really to underline the youth of Elizabeth. She's only 14 years old when this all happens, and I think Don Carlos is also not, like not much older, yeah, exactly. and, and her husband, uh, the king, he's 36. So this already explains a lot about their emotional state of mind. And uh, we always wanted to underline this and also this incredible moment where um, the first scene finishes and we saw Elizabeth Young and in love and that is a big drama and she becomes a queen in such a dark country as it was Spain. Now it's not anymore. <laughs> well, okay. Look at well this offer is an enormous undertaking. Which is like the snake at the bottom. These are can seem like little details, but they make such an incredible difference in how we um, understand the, the breadth of the genius practice. Genius is indeed a word. The next live in HD series is made possible thanks to its founding sponsor, the Neubauer Family Foundation. Digital support is provided by Bloomberg Philanthropy. The Met Live in HD series is supported by Rolex. Today's performance of Don Carlos is also being heard over the Toll Brothers Metropolitan Opera International Radio Network. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be in a subterranean rehearsal studio to check in on the upcoming new production of Donizetti's Lucia di Lamermoor. See you in 10 minutes. You go, don't forget to take this. Dear friend and colleague soprano Nadine Sierra is working her way through the opening bars of opera's most famous mad scene. She's preparing for the Met's new production of Donizetti's Lucia di La Mermura. Let's check it out. Oh, 
Nadine. I'm so proud of you. You just took my breath away. I need a minute. Woo. I'm so excited for you. Oh my goodness. You know, you've honed this role of Lucia on the stages of leading opera houses in Europe, and now you're bringing her to the Met. What is so appealing about playing opera's most unhinged character? Amazing. And also, you know, it's a way of showing uh, the struggles that certain young women face in their life, not just in an opera, right, in a, in a theatrical sense, but also kind of showing that on stage in a realistic sense um, and bringing about those issues through theater so that the audience can walk away thinking a lot about it. Um, and it's always a pleasure to do that. I, I love singing Lucia. Well, I know that uh, this new production by director Simon Stone is set in today's American Rust Belt. Mm -hmm. How does a change in setting affect your approach to the role? A lot. It changes a lot. I, I think also because the setting is going to be more contemporary and modern of this day and age, it will feel a lot closer to me because I've grown up in this time. And so I think I can kind of portray Lucia in a more personal way, a way that fits more to me as a modern day woman. Um, and hence, I think she'll probably be a little bit more believable to the audience. I think so. You always speak and sing straight to the heart. And I can't wait to see this. And you've already done the photo shoot. I've seen your photo outside. Um, I know it's only the first day of rehearsals, but how do you imagine a present-day Lucia influencing her performance in terms of the clothing and, I don't know, the style? A lot. Yeah, because, I, I, because it's this modern day production that we have, it, it's going to feel more tangible to me. You know, not just representing Lucia in the way that we all know, you know, her being an extremely famous role to sing vocally, but what is she as a person? Um, how can I make her more believable to an audience rather than it just being these uh, vocal um, kind of Displays. Olympics? Yeah. 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 Um, wow. So marrying the two, the vocal side, but also the real human being side. We are so looking forward to this. And I just want to thank you for allowing us to join in on your rehearsal. I can't wait for Lucia de la Ramour when it's in cinemas on May 21st. Thank you, Nadine. <laughs> thank you. Now let's return to today's opera, where the plot is about to thicken. As the next act begins, Eboli has set up a clandestine encounter with Don Carlos, which he only accepts because it is Elizabeth he thinks he will be meeting. Here now is the explosive third act of Verdi's Don Carlos.